Welcome back to the Celtic Soul Podcast with me, Andrew Millen. Today we will have the second part of our conversation with Willie McStay. This episode has been sponsored by Carrington Lodge, Dulic County Mead. Thanks to Simon and the team for their continued support. If your business or Celtic Supporters Club would like to sponsor the podcast, please get in contact by emailing us at info at celticfanzine.com. You can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. Celtic returned to the top of the table on Saturday after beating Livingston 3-2 at Celtic Park. The following day, the Rangers from across the city went back on top after they drew 2-2 with Hibs. Celtic will entertain Hibs on Sunday at Celtic Park, but before then the team travelled to Lafayette to take on Riga. I fully expect us to beat the home side and be in the next round of the, of the Europa League before the important group stages. Celtic fans seem split about the importance of this competition and competing in the Europa League without the riches that the Champions League brings. Some fans don't seem to care if we reach the group stages or not, such as the importance of this historical season is domestically. But as I said, I fully expect us to win away and I fully expect Neil Lennon to continue with the squad rotation. We've got two games a week now and it's important that all the players get game time. Hibbs will pose a bigger threat than Livingston did, but even Livingston asked a few questions of us late in the game after we dominated for long periods. They gave us a nervy end to the game and hopefully we won't have that against Hibbs and we can then kick on for the rest of the season. With COVID-19 cases now on the rise in Ireland and Scotland, I fear that getting back to Celtic Park soon is a long way off. We all had hoped to be back in for the Rangers game in October, but as I said, it seems very unlikely. But we still wait and hope. On Friday, we spoke to Willie about the youth players he coached during his time at the club and how the recruitment policy is working at the club at the moment, from eight-year-olds right up to the senior team. We also spoke about the late great Tommy Bones. We pick up the conversation today with Willie talking about the McStay's historical connection with Celtic, his own career with Celtic and elsewhere. I want to go back to the McStay name. It's forever linked with Celtic. Can you give the listeners an insight into your famous ancestors? And then we'll speak maybe a little bit of your dad. You know, and when you were growing up, you know what the McStay name meant to your family? Yeah, it's like, obviously for us, uh, like, no... Knowing them, the time span was, was, was too much, but everything like uh, that was going to us passed through my father uh, and my dad's uh, brother, you know, Uncle Jim. I don't know if you know that, uh, that you know that during our time, Seamill was a place where we'd go to, you know, prior to big European games, cup finals, and things like that. But uh, way back in their days, like, you no know, Napier and people like that would be out in Netherburn, which is a place. You drive through a lot call and head out there, you know, with Jimmy Steele. You know, if, if you remember Jimmy, you know, with uh, the physio, you know, he was from Lark Call and like uh, obviously the influence of uh, like Jimmy and Willie McStay as well. Like you no know, Celtic used to go out there you know, to get away from everything, away from the city. And you, know, you hear stories and I, I know what Netherburn was, was like, you know, my dad took us out and you just can't imagine Celtic Football Club. I've been out there to to do training, and I think there was only one pitch which was wasn't great. So they were out there at times doing like you no know, the training and getting away from the city to prepare for pre season or prepare sometimes for games as well. But no, the Betty Old is uh, another person that passed on stories to us you know, about how they would dress, and you know, when you look back in pictures of the days, everybody did call them tie. They were a immaculate. You know, the way they would turn up training, never mind football games and you know, the discipline they had. And you know, those little mementos that we've gathered uh, ourselves as well. Uh, but the stories like, you no, know, I passed through my dad. And uh, I remember, like, you no, know, just uh, you know, the funeral. That was uh, you know, like a big, a big thing, like, you no, know, people talking about you know, when they pa- passed away. And uh, like, obviously, her name, yeah, in that area, you know, the two, Jimmy and Willie coming from Netherburn, and that's where my dad was born, and we moved into that call, and uh, you know, people knew us. Uh, I think, uh, you know, being, I would say, you know, football daft, you know, the family, uh, my father was a, a good player in his own right, uh, trials with Kilman or Patrick Thistle, and uh, Celtic Wood, my trial as well, uh, he was a, St. Rocks and at that time, you know, junior football was was a, a massive thing, like Paul Thistle, Les Mahago. But they came to a stage where he, he pulled away for that and uh, 
it was I think mainly to like you no know, guide myself, you not know, being the oldest one and, and, and Paul and Raymond, you no know, into football. You no, know, he was a good coach, Hamilton Aki's tried to get my dad to be a coach there, but he decided to stay in the boys' clubs and I think that's where my dad was really respected in Lapcall, the, the the amount of work he did, you know, in the community in terms of uh, Know, starting teams and doing things the right way and people knew him through that and then as we progressed through signed with Celtic and Scotland International School Boys and all the way through people like no respected us uh, through what my dad and my granddad did in that call how they represented themselves so like no that was the name and yeah you did feel that you know, the, the McStay name was was there uh, people knew you because you were no the next day, but it was for different reasons. The great uncles playing with Celtic, my dad being involved in football, and then through time, like the three of us, all made to professional football as well. Interesting times, uh, but definitely my dad was a the link between keeping, you know, the name going between like Jimmy and Willie, and then you know the three of us coming through. And your dad is credited as well with. Uh... Kieran Tenney caught his eye, and you, you've seen his notepad, his notes. Am I right in saying yeah. that? Yeah, I've been through, like, uh, no, I don't know, like, no, you're putting out, but my dad passed away, and, like, no, he did scouting things. I've actually got one in the room there that I found just only a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, like, it kept a good, a good tight record. Now, as I was going through it, I'd just seen the name Tumble. And it's eleven year old. He's eleven year old in this report, and it's through another room. It just came in when you were talking, and basically you're saying, "No, the boys have got special talent. Need to fr- pass track from and all that." And so, like, no, he's there now, but no, yeah. and that's back like, to like identifying and recruiting. No, obviously at that time he, he's, uh, you know, people have recognised his talent. Oh, I don't know what age David is now. He's nineteen. Uh, so you know, that's a few years ago as well. So, but there'll, there'll be scouts and uh, people get stories like that. We know that they've identified the player. The most important thing is getting them in for different reasons. Sometimes it doesn't happen. So, but that's uh, <laughs> like his work and uh, the little book you're talking about. I done a presentation and like hey, what about <sighs> not scouting and it was a note. The notebook versus the laptop, you know, to talk about that was a trigger for older scouts, who's the wee guy with the hat on and the, the coat and the wee notebook and whatever. And then you've got the, you know, the new scouts that so, would know, be like uh, looking at like percentages and on systems and all that. And like, you no, know, and I say, like, you know, what's valuable? I need both. I need both in the system. I don't want to lose the experience of these guys because they've seen it before. And they can visualise a certain player that they're watching now and compare them to another player. And that's why, like, you know, the, the, they've done the cycle before, but the, the younger ones, it's a different way. You're getting information a different way. So in the in the talk, I, I said, like, you know, how much is it there for that laptop? And uh, somebody saying £600 or whatever. And what about that notebook? I a pound. And I pulled that out of my pocket and I said, oh, see that one? It's worth 25 million. Because <laughs> that's where the notes were the first time that he'd seen Kian. And he was and Kieran Taylor was only eight. Yeah. Okay. So that was that one. So you've got really, me going, yeah, uh, all these stories. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but Willie, like, like, like it's such it's so good to hear. Your dad was, you know, scouting for Celtic and the players that he, he was taking notes and then he, he was recommending to the club. And but before I skip on to something, I just want to you know mention that you know your own son John is still at the club now. He's he's coaching. Yeah, he's, he's doing very well. And loves the job, uh, the job he's got you now. Uh, and obviously, I did a big desire to to be involved in coaching. Uh, so he's been doing the partnership clubs in Northern Ireland and now he's you know, Europe as well. And you know, that's his main job. And he does the. I think he's working with me a drag. Uh, this season uh, I think it's under 13s or 14s so they're just starting off just now so uh, that'll be good good for him good recognition as, as well because he was a key figure in the, the junior academy 
work in there. So now he's moved into the intermediate one as well. So now good luck to him. He's, he's, uh, he works hard and hopefully he gets his few awards. Hopefully. A lovely lad as well. I've met John on a couple of occasions. Now, back to your dad. He's obviously proud that he, he caught the, he, these young players caught his eye. But he must have been so proud when his three boys saw him for Celtic. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, just, Raymond, oh. really makes day. All names associated with Celtic. Yeah, he's a, a proud man. Uh, and we've like no him to thank for you know, the way he looked after us and the way that he encouraged us all the time. You know, and in that call to start you know, the teams and sacrifice uh, himself at times as well, you know, what he wanted to do and his ambitions. You know, but it was for us. And uh, as I was saying, the pictures are there as well. And like, I'm sure he's proud and we were proud of what he did as well. So, yeah. I suppose uh, as far as successful goals and team appearances, you're going in the middle because Raymond didn't play as much as you two. And then Paul, well, we all know how, how loyal Paul was to Celtic. You know, named in the greatest ever eleven. What a brother to have! You know, what a talent! Like he, he's just—he's such an iconic figure now among the support because of not only how good he was, because there was good players in that team, but I think you know, Paul was the standout one, and I think as well the fact that he never left us. Yeah, uh, and like obviously mentioned Raymond first. Raymond uh, got on the bench once, and uh, that was the time of the takeover. It was a. Uh, Pre Bosman as well, so it was one of the ones where if you're offered a new contract, you no, know, that was you automatically re-signed. So yeah, so he, he, he got there, close, went down to Wigan, down to Cardiff, back up to Hamilton, and then moved into you know different other things and doing well now. But no, Paul, just say like one club man, uh, it doesn't happen too often. No, James is in that category at the moment, uh, and. Uh, like got plenty of opportunities and plenty of suitors and we're looking for, for him you know, to go down south to go to Europe but uh, it was Celtic that was his team uh, but he was always linked when, the, when Italian football was the creme de la creme of world football Paul was always linked with these big moves and you know no one would have blamed him if he went but he stayed and there were there were some barren times, like you know, and tough times, as you say. Like, yeah, it, it was. It was always a constant, wasn't it? And, like no, just I, I remember, like no, uh, even training. You no, know, some of the things he did were wow. You no, know, it's just as if he dies in the back of his head. He knew where everybody was, and he could turn and like no, oh, just open up the game and his way of pass. He, he didn't pass it to you. He passed it for you. If you know what I mean. You no, know, he was given it the right weight, the right side. Uh, and then, you know, he was goal scoring as well. He scored a few few screamers. But, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was different times. There was all the great highs and, uh, you know, and a few disappointments as well. Uh, and he had to be big enough to get through that. And, yeah, there was a lot of talented boys there, but it didn't, you know, players at the time. But they always needed something, you know, whether it be a centre back at the right time or another striker or whatever, like then Rangers were coming there spending, like no, obviously the game finish years bringing up the boys, the, the players from England as well. So it was a tough, a tough ask, but he uh, doesn't regret it. That's for sure. Like no, he's proud of what he's what he done. Top player. The special thing was people always. I, I don't have a laugh at times. Uh, when people say that no, your brother. And the uh, Celtic supporters uh, idolise them, and you know, people ask you the question. And sometimes inside you go, oh, like, no, you're idolising a player that you don't know. He's my, he's my brother. He's my brother. So one of the best players, and like, no, for me, he was, he was top. Like, no, it's not as if you just know the, the player. He, he's your brother. That was special. Thank you, sir. And there wasn't any comparison between myself and Paul either, uh, Andrew, because uh, two different positions, two different type of players and, and whatever. But there was a resemblance with Raymond coming through, same position and whatever. And if it was it, if it was ever difficult for anybody, it would have been Raymond, you know, because Paul was there before him, same position in comparisons. And 
any footballer, whether you, uh, you want to be judged uh, or compared to a person the same age in the same position, but how can you be compared yeah. to somebody that's a different position, yeah. but also is you know, that type of thing? And that's where like, you know, we're just so proud of each other, uh, but maybe you know, people would look at Raymond a wee bit as well, which was unfair because he was a talented boy as well. And you need opportunity. No, I wish you would have got, got that anyway. Everybody needs luck as well. Um, yeah. But it, it's funny, but like but just before we move on from Paul, uh, when I'm doing the question and answers, we've had to, like, you know, it, you open up to the floor and people will say, you know, well, who's the best player you played with or the most talented player. And when I'm, in, when I'm doing an interview with uh, someone from Paul's generation, I have to say, you know, like, because every single one of them say Paul McStay. But then we have to say, but well, let's take Paul out of the equation because there was plenty of other players. Because, you know, we have a talk with Paul because every single player that played with him, you know, he's at the top of the list. If you move forward to, you know, doing nights with Chris Sutton or John Hart or something, it's the same with Henrik. Henrik just gets thrown out. So you kind of have to take him out of your equation for the Q&A to get, to get information on other players. And, but I'm with Willie, right? So we spoke about the brothers. Let's speak about Willie now. Signed in 1977, you had to wait till 83 to make your debut. I suppose that, that unknown fullback, Danny McGrain, was probably keeping you out of the team. <laughs> uh, it's not too bad. That was uh, they came an S form uh, like 1977 and then came in at the end of 78 uh, and, and the ground staff, uh, a great ground staff, uh, Matt Reed, Charlie Nicholas, Danny Craney. Jerry Crawley was there, uh, lad Hugh Ferry, myself, and that was it. So, and you'd be scrubbing the boots and doing the jobs and out training with the group. And the time you just get thrown in with the first team, you knowing it was sink or swim. But what a, an education it was uh, that particular time. A dream come true to go into Celtic Park and to be part of it. But every day you were meeting, you know, the, especially the early days, you know, Roy Aitken, Danny, like people coming into the boot room, having a bit of a chat with you, and like you're starstruck at the start, and uh, then you become one of the group, and it was uh, a long haul. Like uh, we, we were there, it was the first year of the under eighteen pro youth, and uh, so two year in that, and then into the reserve team, two year, then four, four and a half, half year, like uh, in about in about the first team. And uh, great, great times, uh, great people, great club, and like you no know, afternoons. Like John Clark would maybe take you. You know what the stadium was like then. There was a grass area down at Celtic End. He'd take you out for wee extra bits of training and things like that. No, it was it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And then when you get pulled into one of the squads, uh, the kind of stepping stone was, you no, know, like uh, like no chat, you no know, say charity games, but you not know, the pre season. You'd go into them or uh, testimonial games. Oh, you know, you'd maybe get you no know, dropped into the squad, and before you know it, you were in the you no, know, you were in the the first team squad. And you know, I remember my debut. Uh, it was breaking, and I wasn't in the squad. Uh, I'm in the house at that call, uh, and the phone went, but my dad answered it, and it was uh, you know the phone call DBA. Like uh, I'd made my debut off the bench under. Uh, Billy McNeil, you know, which was incredible you know, at the end of the season against Motherwell. But this was pre-season, the following season, David took over. And uh, it was a case of, you know, David, my dad, passes a phone to me, you know, get yourself in, you're playing the day. That was it. And uh, it was a, an illness uh, to Tom McAdam. He took ill that morning. So I went in, rushing in, not prepared, you know, straight in, in through the door, into the team, you're playing, and that was it. And it was probably the best thing that ever happened. Uh, it was breaking at home, nil-nil draw, get man in the match. <laughs> and uh, I think that because of maybe young and you know, the the team didn't perform to the level. Midweek, we played Airdrie, we scored six, I actually broke from defence, got brought down uh, for a penalty. And that was me playing centre-back. Uh, and the following Saturday was Rangers. Yeah. The first league game of the season, Celtic Park, six odd thousand. So that was it. 
and uh, we won the game 2-1. Uh, Roy Aiken and Frank McGarvey after going one down uh, as well, and Coyle scored early in the game, and that was uh, that was it. You're on your way. Uh, in between, as you mentioned there, Danny McGrain at right back and Roy Aitken at centre back. That was the two. Not kind of Roy being sweeper type thing and Tom being and uh, Roddy McDonald before that. They not being the main number five. So there were the two guys uh, to try and oust. Uh, they weren't the bad players, they too. No, they were all right. I've read a few bits and pieces <laughs> about them, a few snippets. <laughs> well, you uh, said that you said so, that the Rangers game, um, and you talked about Pretty, that that was that was probably one of the most proudest moments, you know, for Paul and myself to play. That was the first game, you know, we played together, you know, for the parents and and, and ourselves. And there's a picture of the two years uh, in front of the jungle, you know, the jungle's you know, jam packed in the background. Uh, and that was uh, like great memories, uh, and, and you no, know, what we we done after that, you no, know, two scoring against Rangers in the one game, and been the first two brothers, you know, to win the the hundredth cup final, nineteen eighty five. So they they were all like milestones, you no, know, for me and, and and obviously the family, you know, for us to be do, doing it ourselves. Then I go on and have my career here, here, there, and everywhere. And uh, like Paul was just. The constant, he was just outstanding and fantastic, and it, it, it like, no, it, it deserves that accolade of being in the greatest ever Celtic team. That's for sure. And, and the highs and lows, really, against Rangers, because I spoke to Alan Thompson about getting sent off as well, and like he, he said, like it's a it's a long place in the dressing room. Talk us through that sending off. Oh God, like as I say, the record actually was good against Rangers, but that one uh, was the run into the. Uh, the league that we won at Love Street and we'd been on a good run and like obviously if we get through the Rangers game it's going to be a, a big one uh, for us as well so we actually didn't start the game well as a team and the, my, my memories are that you know, we scored against the running play and uh, it was going. It was a game that from the off became a ding dong you know, it was one team attack, the other one attack, that type of thing. Uh, a couple of scares, you no, know, with Packy. Uh, I think there was one where it slips through and it's a real mucky day and there's a wee bit of scramble. And I uh, remember the free kick, playing the ball diagonal uh, and there's a knockdown and it comes back in and Morris Johnson scores. Uh, so Ooh. we're two up. <laughs> my roommate. My, my roommate. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so... No, we're two up and you know, I broke and like we're lap. We've still got to play. And the uh, early part of the game, there's a like uh, Ted McMahon goes at, at me and it's it's not even a foul. Like, and he comes against my leg and I get looking for it. And uh, so in a day like that, that's not what you wanted early in the game, you know, for something that's not a real challenge. Uh, and it got towsy, uh, and Ted McMahon get booked for a challenge on me and the two years were tussling on the ground type thing and then there's the game's just so open and uh, I've tackled in front of the dugouts and thank God I took the ball because it was one of the ones you, you, you go through everything and uh, the vivid moment is Rangers in the attack the ball comes in from their right hand side across the face of the goal and that's and I think I was talking about yesterday Celtic fans like, over the years have been in the, the Celtic end at Ibrox but in their day Celtic support all the way up to the halfway line you know, to the tunnel and also had about three sections of the main stand and across from the the, the guys, there's a section in the other stand as well it's amazing the amount of support that you had so anyway this ball flashes across and uh, I get, it's one of the ones, where's, who's closing them down? So I go out, and uh, as I'm going out, the ball's slowing down to the touchline. And uh, it's a, a case of going slow down, but there's a moment where you go, I can get this. So there I go, and I slide in, and the ball moves past my leading foot. And at that moment, it was like a car crash. You just know, you just know what's going to happen. I'm off as if time just stood still 
and I said, and I just followed through. And I, when I got up, I knew, I knew that that was it. Like, no, I didn't even go near the referee. Looked at him and just walked up. And uh, from that, like people say to me, like the four each game was the best, the best old fun game I've ever seen. And I said, well, you're lucky. I've only seen thirty five minutes yet. <laughs> 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 that was it. I'm, I'm down there and missed a great game. Uh, but no, it was uh, at, at the time, like you thought, you get that tackle right, that's that you dominated you know, the game going forward. You're two up. You're uh, the player that you're playing against. You're, you're starting to you know, dominate him. Uh, you're right in front of the Celtic fans as well. Uh, but it just shows you the fine lines. And that was it. Uh, I knew it was off and, and went in. So the great thing was we, we went in an unbeaten run. In fact, a lot of straight wins. Then we won the league at Love Street and uh, it makes it all the more sweeter. A few beers that happened. night, I'd say, wasn't there? Yeah, well, I got married uh, like about what, eight days after we won the league. Uh, in fact, I think our wedding like was... The first time we all got together after, and like the, the footage of the videos is unbelievable, unbelievable. You no, know, the, the players and that was them letting their hair down. Uh, so great memories, a great year apart from the the red card, but the end product was memorable. You no, know, people not giving us a chance, and we get down there and, and do do the business. And I remember Jim Stewart holding the ball and the place erupting. That was the moment you knew you were champions. It was oh, a, a special day. Really, just going back to the to the Rangers game, um, two things that I'm always curious of, right? Did you get a bollocking a half time off Davy Hay? Well, I'm sitting in there waiting and uh, if you remember Rangers score before half time. So it's two one, it's not two 0 uh, I've still got the gear on, drenched, uh bit of respect. Definitely going to sit there and take what what happens so I'm sitting there and David came in and uh, all he done was talk about what we're going to do he never reflected on the first half at all he says this is what we're going to do and uh, never never mentioned it it wasn't important then no it was what, what we were going to do as a team and like no that when they went out for the second half I'm sitting there like Phew. no what about he it works out like no the management, no like how the psychology can work as well. And he said to me later, he says, uh, he says to me, well, it's, it wasn't your fault you could set off. It was mine, and I, I've not even said anything back. He says I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> no, he, he knew I was on the edge, that type of thing. And uh, no, that was that was after it. But that's unbelievable uh, the, the way he was in control of everything. There wasn't any, he knew what he had to do. He had to get the team right for the second half. And it was a roller coaster because uh, it went 3-2, 3-3, 4-3 Rangers. And then Murdo like, you know, scored an absolute screamer uh, to, to get the 4-4. And to be fair, I think, I, I remember like, looking back on it and both sets of supporters well, no gave a stand innovation to the, you know, the the players on the pitch. It was a memorable game for many things. So for me, it was uh, like thirty five minutes. <laughs> yeah, the other question I have right is when you're in the dressing room before your first Rangers game, the adrenaline, the mix, you must be. You know, you've grown up a Celtic fan. It's the biggest game, you know, the calendar domestically. You know, it's a local derby. It's it's everything. You know that first time you, you had you hadn't that much first team experience. Yeah, in the dressing room. You know, tell us, tell us what goes through, what goes through. Uh, your mind. See, to be honest, the the breaking game that I said was just what a win. Like, no, get yourself in. You're playing a uh, league cup game. Midweek was a second league cup game against uh, Airdrie. So I'm still. Like no, the emotions and uh, excitement of making my debut. Then you followed it up midweek, and here we are playing against Rangers the following Saturday. Uh, so for me, it was excitement. 
uh, it was new, the games had went well before it, and you were up for it. And then the special thing, we obviously, like Paul, ourselves, that wee bit of attention uh, from the media before it as well. Uh, so it was a lot of excitement. I didn't feel nervous in, in, in the first one. Basically, you know, like some of the like Brian Scott take the noise when we went out for the the warm up was incredible. You know, in Celtic Park, we break in at home, Airdrie, you know, Broomfield, like the atmosphere was uh, was good. It was supportive, if you know what I mean. But when you come out, you know, the crowd are in and like the noise was unbelievable. And uh, Brian, you know, I spoke to Brian Scott and. It was one of the old jokes, like they said, what? I said it again. He was like, what? No. And I said it again. And it was, like, you can't, you know, I'm, I'm actually saying to him, like, no, oh, this noise, you can't hear yourself. No, and uh, I'm so excited that he, you know, that old joke that like he's done me three times, no. Uh, and that's the way it was. Like, you, it was more excitement. Now, as you settle in to being a first team player, you start to then, really know the importance of games and that's where you know, the, your mindset can go different ways and, that, and I mentioned earlier there's been great players like you know, came to Celtic Park and Highbrooks uh, terrific talent and renowned has been good players but not been able to handle you know, the, the whole thing you know, the package of 24-7 and the must, must win and crowd reactions and all that so uh, the more you're settled into the team you do Think more about you know, the you know, the importance of the game and the opposition, and you no, know, you get more. You think more about the game, whereas early early games, you're just so excited to show what you can do. If you know what I mean, and, yeah. uh, then even with the supporters as well, the supporters are fantastic. At, uh, at even from you know, my own point of view, like you know, supporting you and encouraging you when you know, because they know that you're. You're new to it, and what you find is once you're in your second year, that no, 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 the support you, but it'll be more uh, analyze your game more as well. And that's when you have to step up to the plate, and you know, sometimes you reach a, a level, and, and that's it. Uh, you know, but uh, for me, it was just incredible, like, you know, to be there. When you leave Celtic, it's it's so strange, you know, because. Uh, you know what it's like. People want to talk to you, uh, and no, people no, they might even be not even Celtic supporters. Like no, like know who you are. No, so and you always got that wee feeling somebody's looking at you. No, I went down to Huddersfield after Celtic, and uh, like uh, nobody really bothers. They just like you get on with things. No, and then I moved to Nottingham. And Nottingham was good as well. So. And, and you know, but there's more freedom down south. You no, know, that people don't. It might, might be different now with social media and all the different things there. But in, in the days, like you no, know, you played the game and and that was it. Uh, you back to your family and back in training the next day or whatever it is. Uh, you know, down in England, but it's Celtic. You no, know, it was twenty four seven. You had to carry yourself the right way all the time. You no, know, do what you can on the pitch to be the best you can, but off the pitch you had to represent yourself and the club as well yeah many many years ago I interviewed the late Phil O'Donnell and he spoke about leaving the club to go to Sheffield Wednesday I think it was with, with Simon Donnelly and he says like it was amazing stepping out of the goldfish bowl of Glasgow mm-hmm. and being able to go to the cinema and nobody nobody it's, uh, it definitely is like that no like people might recognise you but they'll, you know, they'll just maybe nod or whatever whereas uh, Celtic no no People want to know the club. They want to know you. They want, you know, and, the, and you get it. You, know, you get it both ways. But you've got to be able to handle that, and that's something hopefully we've been able to do. Is it is it hard to leave Celtic, really? Oh, big time, big time, yeah, big time. It's uh, like for us as well, like uh, and for myself to leave and balls it there as captain, and you no, know, I'm moving into the captain at that time. Uh, yeah, it was massive. But yeah, you, you have to do what you have to do. Well, you've got your wife and family. In fact, my, my wife when I left was uh, expecting my first, our, our first kid, John, and uh, that was hard. And I must admit, you know, when I went down to Huddersfield, I broke my ankle the day, 
I went down on the Monday and on the Friday broke my ankle and that was us doing shaping before we played Derby yeah, Derby County at the baseball ground uh, so that was me out so I went there in February and that was me out and I get back for the last game of the season away to Barnsley and I was on the bench oh and Ars Deacon was that actually another team that, so that was a, a hard hard time a hard to leave Celtic but hard in the situation where you couldn't go and play and and be, be one of them. No, you're always on the periphery. Uh, the next season started. Uh, get back into the team and uh, I actually thought St Mirren were going to, going to uh, sign us. Uh, I was told they were watching the game and had been impressed, wanted to take us back up the road. And uh, Malcolm McDonald was the manager of uh, Huddersfield at the time and uh, pulled us into the office after we played uh, Sheffield Wednesday. And... Uh, he says, look, uh, we've got an offer in for you. And, and I'm kidding on, I don't know. <laughs> no, something was looking for us. I'm waiting to say, right, OK, this is a moment. I, di- I didn't want to sign for a, a Scottish club. I could have when I was leaving Celtic, but I couldn't have seen it playing against Celtic and the environment and what you had. So anyway, this was maybe time to go back up the road. And obviously, John had uh, been born at that time, a young baby. Uh, so. When he told us, right, we've got an offer, we've accepted the offer, uh, I'm waiting to act surprised at St Mirren. And uh, he said, not County. I went, what? <laughs> I was not inside myself, not County. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> uh, so the first thing I done was uh, get out of the office and uh, I made a phone call uh, up the road first to my dad. And the second phone call was to Jimmy Lumsden who was my youth coach. He was down in England at the time working. And uh, I told him the story. Like, no, the club's watching me. Uh, there's an offer being accepted by the club for Notts County. He says, well, I get home then now, pack your bag and get yourself down the motorway. What a club. Traditional club. John Barnwell, manager, uh, football man. They'll get good players. And it was, it was the best thing I'd done. I enjoyed my football there. That's where I met Tommy Johnson, uh, Dean Yates, uh, went for like four million, Mark Draper, four million, Gary Burtles, Gary Mills, uh, Paul Hart, uh, just like, a, a very, very good football side and played like the freedom, no, no like Celtic, whereas Huddersfield were, it was more defensive and you know, in a struggling situation, whereas no, it's kind of great. And also, like, uh, it was a great side. So we enjoyed ourselves down there and then came back up to Kilmarno uh, after that. Tommy did remind me when I told him I was going to be chatting to you, he says, now, do, you, do you remember, he says, I was only a kid and really was coming to the end of his career. <laughs> <laughs> he so said, said so you, you, you said you were, I was only coming on for a wee while to talk a few, about a few things. Ah, yeah, said, well, look, look, look <laughs> the, con- the conversation went on. But look, when, when, when you get someone like you, really, with such a... Such a Experience and knowledge of the club. We can't. We can't just keep. God knows when we get it again. <laughs> well, then you moved on to um, Sligo and great success. Three trophies, and then with that success, bring brings you back to Celtic. Then, and as we we spoke earlier on, with Tommy Bones. But one of your former players um, that was with you in the youth set, I spoke to him earlier in the week, Barry John Carr, and he described you as the best coach he ever had. But he said he never realised it until he moved elsewhere. It's nice that like, yeah, people say things like that about you. But I did. I thought uh, you know, coaching was something that uh, I tried to be the best I could. And as I mentioned earlier, go and open up my mind and see different styles and whatever and uh, visit clubs and try and be the first. The, the pro licence there was one of the, the youngest ones that got that as well at that particular time. Uh, and enjoyed it. Uh, and the opportunity to leave uh, as manager, but I came and signed a three-year contract. I think that was a long time, but the three-year flew in and it ended up sixteen and a half year. Uh, that was with the club uh, as head of youth, head youth coach, and reserve manager. So to leave as a player was was difficult, but also uh, to leave after that period of time, and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and after that, of had the experiences of working with Didi Haman at Stockport County, uh, 
like obviously uh, going to Ubicht, you know, I've not met my rivals are Ferenc Faris, to be honest, uh, popular to mention that then at the moment, so that's yeah, a great yeah. experience out there, like no manager at Ross County for a short period, which was a difficult situation, but then I get the opportunity to go to Bristol City as head of coaching with Derek McInnes, and obviously Derek and that changed, and I came back up, and just to stay in the game, I took over a, a club in Carlisle uh, called Celtic Nation which was great for me to just to keep everything going, waiting for the next opportunity. Then I got the opportunity from uh, Chris McCart and obviously Peter to, to come back to Celtic uh, scouting. Uh, first it was European scouting and then it was head of the academy scouting. And it's, been, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. And yeah, I've, I missed coaching at the start, but like everything I do, I want to do you know, to be the best I can. And, and do my best for the club and uh, see where it takes us. So, we, we all know that your heart is in Celtic and there's, there's a lot of pressure on the current team to deliver that 10 in a row, but hopefully we can do it, will he? Yeah, I, mean, I, I was talking to, Paul, talking to Paul about it. And like obviously at the time when like no Rangers were what, no, kind of dominating not the league anyway. And uh, like no looking back and it's one of the ones we just have to keep focus and keep believing and be together I think uh, it's like the 1988 year the centenary year where they need to whenever if ever there's a time where the, the players will need the fans it's now and sadly at the moment no, they're not, not allowed there but hopefully that will change and winning the games and now and wait for the, the crowd in and I'm sure that they'll, they'll, they'll roll them on it makes some difference no, to no, to the atmosphere not just the, the singing and whatever but no, they can they can G up as well no, the road that goes up no, whether it be a attack or a win in a corner or a shot at goal simple things can change the game no, and, and that can be done with the crowd reaction uh, so hopefully we can keep winning and get the fans in and so they can enjoy it. No, like it was difficult for them there to enjoy nine in a row. I think no, it would be unbelievable no, if we get this, not just for history, but no, the big release. And uh, you, But I don't have to tell you, you know what it's going to be like. It's going to be mayhem. No, well, uh, I'm like you, really. I just, I just can't wait to go back into the stadium. I know we, I suppose, got traveling home and away, week in, week out to see Celtic. You, you kind of take it for granted. It's part of your week, but yeah. you know, I'll never take it for granted again. I'll never give out a bit of queue in the airport or be late five minutes in because the toadstools weren't walking or whatever. But look, really, <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, and I really thank you for taking the time to chat to us. Um, and letting us into your Celtic soul. As I said, the McStay name lives on a Celtic. It's just such an iconic name with the club. And hopefully we'll get to get to talk to you again and hopefully the next time we'll be in person. Uh, that'd be great. That'd be good, Bob. I've enjoyed that you've uh, reflected and triggered me into memories. And like, no, I've actually enjoyed it. Uh, and hopefully it came across the right way. Uh, I love what I'm doing and it's been great. Like, you no, know, my own career, Celtic, and all different things that I've done. Uh, but in terms of uh, Paul and Raymond, you no, know, like, you no, know, we're so close. And uh, can reflecting back, my dad and you no, know, Jimmy and Willie, you no, know, way back in the day, as they say. And uh, like, you no, know, just hopefully, like, Celtic can go and win this 10 in a row. And like, I know the whole McSay family will be happy. <laughs> Really, as I said, it's been a pleasure and don't worry, the listeners will love this conversation. Hail, hail, uh, William. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks a lot and uh, take care. Be safe. It's always a pleasure to chat to Willie and I look forward to one day when we can get back into the same room for conversation, maybe at one of our live events. His love for Celtic and football just seems to shine through with every word he speaks. A pure gentleman and all-round good guy. Thanks again to everyone who bought the digital and print edition of the new issue 110 much appreciated because we don't have ground sales at the moment so if you would still if you'd like to order a copy please do it so through the website thanks as always to ronan mcquillan for producing the show if you like what we're doing and would like to support us 
please get in contact with info at celticfanzine.com or through social media. You can subscribe, become a member, buy or donate for the price of the point. Thanks to everyone who has listened and supported us so far. It's much appreciated. Don't forget, folks, you can download the new app. It's free and you can have access to all our podcasts, articles, daily news, video content and info on upcoming events. If we ever get info on upcoming events, the fans in and our online shop, all at the touch of a button on your phone or tablet. All episodes of the podcast are now available on all platforms. So hit that subscribe or follow button so you never miss an episode. We would also appreciate if you could hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, Celtic Fanzine TV. Thanks again to our episode sponsor, the Carentown Lodge du Leak. If your business or Celtic supporters club like the podcast and would like to become a sponsor, please email us at info at CelticFanzine.com. You can also contact us through the website or message us on social media. Keep the comments in and let us know what guests you would like us to have on the show. And as I said before, if you have a story to tell, let us know. Thanks very much to the Willie Maley group who got in contact last week to let us know about the walk. I believe it was a big success. I've seen plenty of pictures and plenty of comments and I believe there was a lot of money raised. So well done to them. If your supporters group are having an event, let us know and we'll give it a shout out. The next episode will be this Friday. It will be episode 30 and we'll have another guest opening up their Celtic Soul Tools. So enjoy the week and let's hope the boys can do the business in Lafayette and return safe and well. But I can't help thinking of how good a trip at this moment in time would be to Lafayette. A few beers with the boys, a bit of crack and an away win. But we're living in strange times and these things just can't happen at the moment. So folks, stay tuned, keep the faith and please stay safe. <laughs>